Welcome to Open Source for Researchers, a podcast showcasing open source software built by and for researchers. My name's Abby. My name's Alvin. And we're your hosts. So every other week, we interview an author published in the Journal of Open Source Software, or JOS. This is episode 12, and today we chatted with Hennen Inwoldsen and their paper, Augmenti, a Python library for structured text augmentation. Kenneth is in his final year of his PhD researching representation learning in healthcare language and genetics. So what did we learn today? That cheese danishes aren't really from Denmark. That's but the they are thing in top of mind. And Kenneth was scared to eat one when he was there, like, yes. Uh, so we had some pastry discussion, which was good, although we saved it to the end. And yeah, this library is a really cool library for augmenting text data and applying lots of different transforms to it, which seems really generally applicable. And actually, we didn't talk about this, but this reminded me of a story I heard years ago that some text classification models have been overfit to the way that people filled in forms. And this was data that was used to, for example, give out credit scores, that kind of thing. So, you know, they've been trained in one particular way, but you could imagine overfitting on a feature where the feature might be, whether you capsulized your words properly or something. And so this is like a library that allows you to make a ton of different changes in a reliable way to a whole bunch of data that's then used for NLP tasks, right? So it was cool. It was an interesting project. Yeah. And I thought it was particularly interesting how they can use it to include more like minority names so that you can have my, more diverse data sets. And it was great also just hearing from Kenneth, who's a serial open source maintainer, uh, just his experience running these projects and building communities around them. I thought he had some great insight. Yeah, for sure. The maintainer and open source stuff was really, really good. I enjoyed that a lot. So yeah, should we jump in? Let's do it. Hey, welcome to the podcast, Kenneth. Well, Wonderful. Welcome. Great to be here. So just to kick us off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and just your background? Yeah, no, my name is uh, Kenneth. I'm from Aarhus University in Denmark, and uh, I work with natural language processing and kind of representation learning for healthcare and genetics as well. Yeah, and then I've created, do a lot of open source work, especially in Python and around language processing. And I think I'm right in saying you're close to finishing your PhD, is that right? Well, yeah, no, I'm you're finished. in your, well, maybe you're in your final year, but maybe you're close or not close. I don't know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Final year. And I, I hope to finish it by August. Oh, yes. Very good. Wow. We wish you good luck with that. It's, it's always a, a hard time, but maybe you, it's going to be a brief. This was a really nice piece of software that you published in just, and so we're excited to be talking to you about it today. Let's see, should we talk about the origins of the project? It would be great to hear why, why you started Aug Augmenti. What were the kind of problems you were looking to solve? What sort of gaps you were filling that you didn't feel were already well addressed by the project? Yeah. So the origin was this project called DAISY, which is a Danish NLP pipeline for Danish created using Spacey. And I kind of wanted to test how well it worked on all sorts of variations. For example, in Danish, you can either spell with these Danish specific letters or using like the ASCII alternatives, or you can, uh, or kind of the difference between male and female names, and kind of how well it handles spelling errors and maybe how well is it biased towards certain language, like name families, is it specifically sensitive to minorities, for example. So all of these, I kind of wanted to construct, uh, I had a very specific idea of what I wanted to augment and kind of test, but I didn't find any tools that kind of let me build that augmentation on the fly. It was either their specific augmentations or kind of, I had to build it myself. So this is like a, there's an origin story of DC and then Spacey. Can you say just for those people who might not be familiar, what, so Spacey is similar as well. Is that also a augmenting kind of tool chain as well? Oh, right. Yeah. So Spacey is a natural language processing pipeline, which is created by a company called Explosion, which is an open source project where you can kind of both use existing pipelines and kind of develop pipelines as well. In that sense, it is a kind of a, a utility software for creating and running natural language processing pipelines, for example, for extracting named entities or analyzing the the part of speech of a sentence, so that's nouns, verbs, et cetera. 
Okay, so you built both Daisy and Augmenty to work together with Spacey. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember reading the paper, and I thought that was really interesting, just testing, especially around minority names, like substituting in regular names for minority ones and testing to see how well your model like, worked with that. Is that really common practice in NLP nowadays? I'm not as entrenched in that space. I suppose it is. it was for like a brief period, but I think it's kind of gone out of fashion. Like we are, what we're evaluating on now has come to be more general, like large or more complex questions, uh, at least in the literature. I think in industry, I think it's very common to kind of see how well it handles spelling variations, robustness, and kind of, especially if you have some sort of, some sort of kind of uh, anonymization pipeline, you want to make really sure that you, that you don't specifically, don't, like there's groups that you miss out on. Mm. No, I think that's really important. And if I remember correctly from the paper, the big difference with Augmenty compared to other like text augmentation tools is that this this worked with annotations and the text. So it kept that alignment that you needed. Can you talk a little bit about that and why Augmenty is different? Right. Yeah. So like classic methods kind of just take the text in and then replace the name with, with the replace name, right? And then both gives the issue that if I had some sort of annotations, for example, I could be interested in how replacing the names with minority names influences how well it does parser speech tagging, right? But suddenly the parser speech tag are misaligned because the names now two words instead of one, for example. So if you want to evaluate it afterwards, you kind of have to make sure that the labels are correctly aligned. That makes sense. So there's a lot of work in keeping the edits or the augment augmentations, I guess aligned with the other sort of associated metadata around, around the records, it sounds like. Yeah. And there's a lot of work on classification pipelines where you can do this very easily, right? Because you, the label, we assume that this text is still positive or negative, for example, uh, if we just change out the name, right? And that, that annotation is easy to keep, but these kind of text level annotations, those are the where you, those are the places where you see the issues. Interesting. So what I, I have sort of two questions that go together here. I think they go together. They sit here in my head, which is what types of analysis are people applying for and for what use cases? I mean, it sounds like your PhD and your focus is in the healthcare space, but like, it'd be great to hear what specifically types of problems you are tackling. And so what, and therefore what types of annotations you'd be extracting or classification to be extracting. It'd be really cool to hear about that. Yeah, so for the initial project for DAISY, that's been generally most applied in social science and humanities, actually. And here, one of the questions I've gotten quite early on was whether it handles historical documents, which have slightly different spellings. And also, for example, it uppercases the, similar to German, you uppercase a nouns, I believe. And that was kind of a and non-trivial, you kind of have to do parts of speech tagging and then find the nouns and then uppercase them to kind of see how well it performs. But you would kind of do these augmentations to kind of give a, an estimate of how well it would perform on historical data, even though you haven't annotated historical data. Uh -huh. But okay. the pipeline is made to be general enough such that these augmentations can be used. For example, I've seen a use case where people have tried to use it for anonymization, where for processing data for these large language model training, we would like to remove out names or like personal identifier full numbers, right? And we want to replace them with valid numbers, right? Because for example, in Denmark, you have a CPR number as your personal identifier and the start of that is your birth date, right? So we want to have a birth date that is approximately similar, but it should be the same identifier, right? We want to anonymize it, but we want to keep the information that it does provide somewhat the same. And what types of classifiers are people using? Presumably there's a whole range of different algorithms that people might apply uh, based on the, on the text that's being augmented. Is that fair? Or are there particular ones that are, are most popular in, in your field? How, how diverse? So I think for model set, I think almost everyone uses some layer on top of a uh, a language model. So okay. language models here are transformer birds, 
or probably more recently, people have used GPT style models. And then like it, depending on what task you want to do, if you want to annotate specific tokens or named entities or do document classification, you do slightly different like heads on top of that model. Cool. Okay. Okay. So it is the transformers that are lots of people are getting value out of you a lot here as well. So it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And what I found really interesting with this paper was just the many different uses of this augmented text. So either for more training data or to create this testing data, have you seen many projects use it for like unexpected ways or different ways than what you've used with Daisy? So I think the, so I envision is kind of a, it's either testing or it's creating training data, but I have actually seen software use it in application for when people want to anonymize text, they use it as an interface. So you say, what kind of new names can you substitute existing names with? And then you just, it just creates the augmenter and applies it. So actually it's used in kind of a interactive production environment for anonymization, which, which wasn't my expectation at all. Interesting. Yeah. You were talking about anonymized before, but I assumed that was just anonymized the training data, but that's cool that it's actually used on that end too. What does the process look like if somebody wants to extend the library then and develop their own novel? What's the term you call it an augmenter? Like what's the right, what, what's that yeah. piece called? I would call it an augmenter. Typically there would be, I tried to build as many of kind of these blocks that you can kind of patch together for, for augmenter, right? So hopefully you can either, you can probably build your augmenter from that. For example, if I want to place names, you just specify what are the entities that you want to replace and then you can just either specify a list, but you can also specify kind of a, a generator function, which generates entities based on the previous entity. So for example, it's quite easy to build in an augmented, for example, when I showed my kid name Kenneth Enervalston to KE, you can create a function that does exactly that. And then Minty takes care of fixing any of the document annotations to match that. So you've sort of built the building block that lots of people could use to to sort of pipe together to build their specific augmentation behavior that they would want. Is that a fair yeah. summary? The hope at least. Yeah. Very So looking at some of your recent tweets or um, posts now on X, I think they're called, uh, I saw a lot where you're actively recruiting new contributors for different open source projects you're a part of and recognizing some contributors. How have you found um, growing a community? I know this is something a lot of open source maintainers struggle with. Yeah, so the project you're referring to here is the multilingual MTEP project where we're developing benchmarks for a multilingual text embedding benchmark. So these are used in these retrieval augmented generation pipelines, which have become very popular. And this started as a open source project between people who have already kind of I made an extension for Danish and some people made an extension for French. And then we kind of got together and say, let's try to make it a, a large collaboration where we can include multiple languages. Um, and it's actually been impressively well. I think we have more than 50 contributors by now, and we include more than a thousand languages, which is a extensive amount of work people put in it's very lovely, but a lot of the work of kind of recruiting and maintaining people have been both kind of creating good framework for people to contribute. So we made it quite clear that this would be a scientific publication and we kind of made it quite clear what you need to contribute to be credited in the paper as well. I think that makes it easier for people to contribute because they know how much they need to put in. That's nice. You're actually crediting the contributors in the paper. Yeah, yeah, we specify basically you have to do a certain amount of work to be invited to write the paper and then you are when okay. you once you write the paper then you become a co-op as well. Oh are can most contributors just adding like a, a new language or are they are people working on like the core library or both? I, I guess where are you seeing most activity and where have you struggled to find help? So we definitely see people start out with adding a data set. That's where we kind of optimize the package for before and like, it should be very easy to add a data set and adding a data set shouldn't introduce any merge conflicts with other data sets. But once they kind of started that process of contributing one or two data sets, then some people have just been like, that's fine. That was what I needed to do here and moved on. But a few people have stayed around, found other issues that they could do 
or maybe found a bug and then you encourage them to, if you have the time, can you fix it? I would start here and here, and I'm willing to do a review if you want to put in the work. So I think making it very easy for people to do their first couple of commits has been one of the biggest influences maintaining an, a good open source community. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense having like that easy on-ramp so people can get involved. And these data sets you're talking about people contributing, is that like text in their language? Yeah, so it's typically either text in in your, like some of these data sets are already available on hugging face data sets, but they just need to be reformatted to this new format. But typically it is the text, typically a yeah. query, for example, a question, and then a corresponding article that kind of has the answer for that question. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I wanted to ask you about your more sort of general contributions to open source. I'm looking at your GitHub profile, which is the most organized I think I've ever seen. So congratulations. Yes, I've bravo. looked at a lot. Bravo. It is the best, I think the best readme I've ever seen in terms of like actual information. Mine has a in it just saying hi or something. So yep. just in terms of like quality, of effort, I would give you an A plus. And in fact, some tool you're using is giving you an A plus boost. I was just curious. Is like open source your life? Like, what are you, you think to spend a lot of time writing or contributing or maintaining open source? Like, could you just sort of say a little bit about your broader open source contributions and how you, how you think about spending that time? That's a very good, very great compliment. Thank you. I think most of my work on open source actually comes from kind of me kind of needing that thing. So I think my first contribution was in Spacey version three, I believe, where they, so they released it and I, there was the beginning of my PhD and I just got some great results with the package and I was like, this is amazing. I just need to kind of, I need to get this one thing, like some, I needed something from the model for interpretability stuff. And I got, then you start digging and you start adding stuff and recall making my first PR, which was looking back now is a complete mess, but they're very helpful kind of told me kind of how to structure it and, and get it working right. Okay. But, but after that, I kind of try to, whenever I see an issue in a packet, if I can kind of quickly fix it, if it take me, I just, it's very easy to create a, yeah. But I actually, so when I do larger PR, PRs, it's typically because I need the functionality myself. Yeah. Which I think is the best kind of open source contribution, right? Where you really understand yeah. the problem and yeah, that's the story. Yeah. I think a lot of us tell ourselves that. Just build the thing you need and share it back, which I think is really yeah. my yeah. story. Yeah. I guess I had a quick follow up on that though. Do you have a sort of a playbook now for maintaining and running projects or like, what do you think of yourself as a maintainer? Is that like an identity that you like em embody? Do you think about how to get good at that? It sounds like, you know, thinking about contribution for the language data that we were just talking about, it seems like you thought a lot about contribution. Yeah. Especially it's around like, how do I make it easy to contribute, but also easy to manage. And sometimes I feel like that's a trade-off, right? For example, you would have tests that automatically reformat a PR that comes in, but that can be confusing to people that you suddenly edited the PR. So how do you make good workflows such that the package is easy to work with, but also don't make them too complex such that the contributors find it daunting to get started. And kind of striking that balance, I think I started out trying to automate as much as possible. And that actually ended up when me spending a lot more time fixing the broken CI that I've made. And then kind of now I'm going back to like a very simple make file that runs most of the workflows and that works much better than my very complex CI that I started out with. That's I'm having funny. flashbacks with that, by the way, I've fallen down that rabbit hole as well. Oh man. Yeah, and I spend a lot of time thinking about, yeah, open source maintenance and working with maintainers. And the only conclusion I've come to is that it's very individual for each project. Some projects, like, definitely need that giant automated CI. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to continue. But other projects, you don't quite need that. A make file might be enough. And But the thing that I think is true across all projects is that personal interaction so that you're there helping people when they come in that tends to get people to stick around longer and it tends to get them to invite others and help others more. So glad to hear that uh, you found a system that works for you. Yeah, I also think it's quite different depending on the project. Because 
for example, Augmenti is a project where primarily I maintain it and then people come in, they ask for features and then I typically spend some time or kind of guide them in a direction where they can develop it. But people typically come from a point of use for the multilingual MTEP benchmark project. That's been quite different. People have come in with the sole desire of wanting to contribute and kind of asking, where do I go? That kind of requires a much broader overview of kind of what is needed and where do we have something that people can take on that's easy enough. And I've built some CI, for example, for creating overviews of the package, like, which I haven't done before. Like a lot of that is required in that. That's really interesting. Yeah, it would be great if you had a, like a write up of this somewhere or like as a case study, because I think a lot of maintainers go through the the same process you have, where they try the complicated CI. They're like, "Oh, it didn't work for this kind of project," but for this one, it's really useful and it's really helpful. Yeah, maybe I should do a plug. There you go. I'd love that. And it was great to see this published in Joss. Can you tell us a bit about why you decided to publish Augmenti in Joss? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually, we've published. Two other papers in Joss. One is called Text Descriptives, which is for creating like ty- restructuring time series data for machine learning models in healthcare. And another one is called Text Descriptives, which extract simple to complex descriptives from text, a, which, for example, is used for when you clean large amounts of data. A, both of those processes went incredibly well. It's been most the most pleasant kind of publishing experiences that I've had. I really like the engagement because you set it up as a conversation more than a kind of a single review process. You can engage with the comments for Augmentia. There was a comment about, I think you should change the narrative in this way. And then I disagreed with it. And I was like, I actually think it's better this way because of this and this. And then we had a debate and we kind of got to an agreement with fit it both, but much better than kind of this one time back and forth with a reviewer, which seems much more aggressive in a way. Yeah, it sounds like that worked out pretty well for you. I was actually the editor of this paper with you. So yeah, I mean, I think what you're describing is how we want the reviews to go, which is they're much more conversational. I'll say that when people understand that, I think it works really well. When people don't understand that, it works less well. So just a pretty obvious statement for some people, some, some reviewers and some authors want the review to be like a traditional one where they're sort of, I'm just going to wait here, even though there's lots of comments coming in from the reviewer, I'm just going to wait until they're done. And actually often the much more productive discussion is, or productive review is one where there's actually back and forth. So yeah, it sounds like, sounds like your reviews have gone pretty well. So it's great, great project. Great to hear about what's happening around Augmenti and, and your other open source work. I guess I was curious for Augmenti, are there specific types of contributions you're looking for, things that you would love to get help with from the community at this stage? Like if people wanted to contribute, where would you direct them? So, so I generally would recommend that people use the package and kind of find things that they feel are lacking or things they want to add and kind of contribute that way because I also often find that that's where I find the, the most useful kind of contributions. I think, for example, with augmentations, right? I know that there's one augmentation which I made myself. I think I had a time where I could kind of did one augmenter a day, kind of, that was kind of a side project to, to get some code in, but that just ended up with me kind of finding weird augmentations that people probably wouldn't use. So one, for example, was I did kind of a SpongeBob casing. The even second letter is uppercase. And I guess that's an augmentation that you could do, but it's rarely a thing that you see in practice that people uh, uppercase every second letter in their text. Yeah. But it does seem like finding gaps based on your own usage is probably going to be pretty interesting, right? To, yeah. To somebody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like pull requests are uh, welcome or issues or whatever. So it sounds like welcome, welcome any contributions you found. Yeah. yeah, just to close us off, Kenneth, this has been a great conversation, but how can people find you online? Anywhere they can uh, keep up to date with both Augmenti and your own work? So I think the best place to keep up to date with me is probably on following me on GitHub or on LinkedIn. I think people can also follow me on Twitter, but I'm not that active there. Or X, I suppose it's called. Otherwise, I think that's the platforms. 
Nice. And do you have your, hang on. So yeah, it's uh, your name spelled out for, is that for both? Can you spell out your handle? Hey, I think my handle is KC Enevolson for Twitter. And it's just, I don't know if you have a handle for LinkedIn, but searching on my name would probably get it. Otherwise, I think we can put it in the. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely link those all in the description, but I, I believe it's for GitHub. It's also Kenneth and Wilson. I think it Wonderful. is. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. Well, Kenneth, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fun to learn about Augment. Thanks for spending time with us. Yeah. And good luck with your PhD. This is yeah. coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Open Source for Researchers. We showcase open source software built by and for researchers. You can hear more by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. The Journal of Open Source Software is a community-run journal relying on volunteer effort. If you'd like to support Joss, please consider making a small donation towards running costs at numfocus.org slash donate to Joss. That's N-U-M-F-O-C-U-S dot org slash donate dash to dash J-O-S-S. Open Source for Researchers is produced and hosted by Arkin Smith and me, Abby Kubunak Mays. Edited by Abby and music CC by Boxcat Games. We didn't talk about how much I like the Daisy logo. Get out the Danish. Yeah, yeah, so. That's okay. I spent a lot of work on drawing that on my iPad. Nice. Well, we can, we can mention that on the intro. Maybe Abby could wear that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Cool. cool. Okay. It's a, also, it's a Danish with custom. But it looks things as well, which those are the best kind. So, not 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 the jam. I don't. I, I mean, the fruit to... ones are good too, but the they, the ones with custard are well, really good ones. You can also get them with cheese in the US. I've noticed. Yes. Yeah. You don't do that in Denmark. No, I was very. I was in LA last year, and I was very scared of the of the cheesy ones. It's very weird for me. So oh, we spend like time this. talking about this. Well, I guess we are talking about it. And there we go. We've got this recording. I can insert it. Yeah. It's still recording. I'll insert it. Yeah. Then. In fact, they're called a che- yeah. it's, it's like a cheese Danish in the US. Like, that's what people call them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I've, I've never tried it anywhere else than the US. Oh, man. Those are my favorite ones. I thought they were legit, but not. But it's a funny were. thing. In, Dan- in Denmark, we call them like bread from Vienna. Oh, so like, Viennese bread. Kind of the bread. category, Viennese bread. We don't call them that here. I don't know where they originate, but... They're delicious. We can all agree. Yeah, they are. Yes. Yeah. Do love it. Very good.